All right, once again, welcome to the third session in the MopsCon Spring Preview. I'm your host for this session, Rusty Hall, here with the Tumos. This is our third session of the Spring Preview series. Um, these preview series are meant to give you a taste of the full sessions that you'll see in our MopsCon event coming up in the fall. Today's session is going to be covering your bases, managing privacy compliance in Marketo. Uh, with us today, we have the presenter and our host for the presentation, uh, Keith Nyberg. Keith is a four-time Marketo champion and current champion alum. Uh, as I said, these sessions that we're presenting in the spring preview are meant to give you a taste of the kind of content that you'll be uh, you'll have access to in our full fall MopsCon 2020 event. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for more information coming up shortly around that event. Since you've registered for our spring preview uh, and you're attending this session, I do want to let everybody know that we will be offering a discount code for registration for the full MopsCon coming up in September. So uh, as we uh, send out the follow-up emails with links to these presentations. Also look for that discount code. We'll also be sending out an open call for speakers for MopsCon uh, in the fall, so keep an eye out for that as well. These spring preview sessions will be made available on demand, so we are recording all these sessions. We're going to make the videos available post-session as well as the slide decks available for download. Two housekeeping items that I'd like to get out of the way before we uh, turn it over to Keith and let him take it. Uh, I did want to let everybody know that you know we are in a virtual environment, everybody's working from home, so if we do experience any technical difficulties, any problems with audio, please let us know in the chat panel. Uh, we'll do our best to remediate those problems uh, and, uh, and get back as quickly as possible. So bear with us if you have any technical difficulties. I'd also like to let everybody know that we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of this session, so feel free to use the Q&A feature here in Zoom. Uh, you can post any of your questions there in the questions panel, and we will address those uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, let Keith have a chance to take a crack at some of those questions as we get closer to the end. So we'll allow uh, five, 10 minutes at the end for any live questions. With that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Keith Nyberg. Um, Keith, can you give us a little introduction about yourself um, and kind of tell us about the presentation that we'll be walking through today? Definitely. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Keith Nyberg. I'm a platform. Uh, I'm, I'm a marketing automation. Sorry. Hi, everybody. My name is Keith Nyberg. I'm a marketing technology consultant with Atumos. I'm really excited to be talking about privacy compliance with everybody on the call today. Um, to give you guys a little bit of background about me and where I've come professionally on my way to Atumos, I uh, just wanted to give everybody a quick note that I did start my career off at Sugar CRM. I um, spent about five years there in house manning all of our uh, marketing operations. Um, after my time at Sugar, uh, I actually took about a year off and decided to travel through Southeast Asia. Um, I know all my marketing operations professionals are going to love the ISO alpha codes that I provided there. So if you're smart enough to know uh, what countries those are, you'll know where I've been. Um, you can also see that lovely little photo of me out at Mount Bromo stacking some rocks. Um, after that, I did join Atumos as a marketing technology consultant. Uh, I'm working right now to try to get the San Diego Marketo user group restarted, which uh, stay tuned for that sometime soon. Uh, really enjoying my consulting time. Outside of work, I am also uh, a very big surfer. I enjoy stacking rocks. Um, I run a 120 person Burning Man camp and I like to take my RV all over the place. So you can see my RV there. You can see me uh, doing a fun game with my 120 person camp out there. Uh, and I currently live down in sunny San Diego County in Oceanside specifically. Uh, with that out of the way, I'm really excited to talk with you guys about what we'll be covering today with regards to privacy compliance. And it's funny because the agenda says nothing. We're going to cover nothing today. No, I'm kidding. We're going to cover everything uh, that, that is under the sun with privacy compliance. Some of those components include what privacy compliance is. Um, we're going to be covering the goal of any privacy compliance program, even if it's not the one that we're going to be demoing today, the goals that you should actually have as outcomes for any privacy compliance program. We're then gonna jump into an actual demo um, after we discuss some of the fields in the segmentation, an actual demo of the real program as it exists in our instance that we can see all the, all the bibs and bobs. And after that, we're gonna cover some quick steps to implement this program. Um, per anything to do with privacy compliance uh, programs that manage legal obligations of a company, uh, just wanted to remind everybody that this is not legal advice. Uh, the topics that we're discussing today are purely philosophical um, and no guidance that we're providing today should be considered as legal advice to you. Um, privacy compliance as a whole is really, really tricky and it is your job to work with your legal team to balance the risk and business success. Too much enforcement can affect the business negatively, um, as most of you will know, and not enough enforcement can lead your company into legal consequences 
it's not your job as a marketing operations professional to determine what that balance is or what the right balance is for your company. It is your legal teams. So let your legal team do their job, let them determine that balance um, and, and make sure that you're building the program we're gonna discuss today that's gonna make sure that it actually um, is taking what they want and making it happen. Without any further ado, I'm gonna jump into starting to talk about what is privacy compliance. Um, I was searching around for some fun content related to this presentation and I came across this map, which I think is really fun to kind of initiate the conversation around why privacy compliance matters um, and why it matters to the marketing operations professional. Um, as you can see, there's lots of pretty colors up on this map, which means that there's a lot of different privacy compliance regulations that exist around the world. All that blue are countries that have some form of legislation. Um, some of them are in draft and then there's only a handful that don't have legislation. Um, and a few that have no data. Um, to put some numbers around that, almost 65% of the world does have some privacy compliance legislation that, that governs the country. Um, again, there's 8% with drafts, legal. Again, the, the whole point of me showing you this is to remind everybody that there are lots of laws, right? There are tons of laws that we need to consider. It's really hard potentially to, to determine all the laws that we need to support. But the goal of the program that we're gonna be building today is to, to manage all these laws in the most efficient and effective scalable way that we can. Um, and we're going to talk all about how to do that. So in terms of what compliance really is outside of just, you know, colors on a map and legislation, uh, privacy compliance is a company's accordance with established personal information protection guidelines, um, specifications, or legislation. And what that boils down in, in layman's turn to me is, is a company with good privacy compliance processes adheres to regional regulations and enforces these regulations in their communication strategy. Uh, meaning whatever needs to be taken on the record, we're going to be taking those action and we're not going to be doing anything that we're not allowed to do based on where people are located. So let's get into some of the verbiage that we're going to use that's going to help guide our discussion today. Um, I'm sure anybody who's dealt with privacy compliance before has heard a lot of these, but just wanted to reiterate those for those who have not um, expressed consent, any freely given, specific, unambiguous indication, you know, it goes on and on about basically somebody going in and, and checking a box for us. Um, and telling us that they're actually okay with us reaching out to them, right? That's like an expressed consent. Uh, there's also this implied consent component, which is, you know, you may have a business relationship, you may have certain transactions that are commercial that are considered. Um, at the end of the day, this is how legal is gonna be approaching privacy compliance and trying to interpret some of their laws. Um, for us, this is kind of like uh, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't necessarily mean much to us, and that's only because as operations users, we're gonna think of these a little bit more tactically, meaning like what actions the user can actually take with our web forms um, and, and what other implied consent pieces we have. So in terms of how MOPS thinks about these components, um, expressed consent for us most commonly is an opt-in, right? It's a Boolean checkbox that's gonna live on a form and we're gonna ask people to append that box when they're submitting the form to tell us that they're consenting to the marketing that our company is providing, right? Um, a higher level of express consent in some countries that require it would be like a double opt-in. So not only are we asking them to check that initial box um, to show their consent, we are actually asking them to confirm that um, by an email, um, by submitting an additional form, some other double mechanism that's gonna safeguard knowing that we have actually gotten a secondary form of consent outside of that initial consent. In terms of the implied consent components, um, opt-out is one that I think a lot of people are familiar with, specifically people located in the United States. Some regions do not require any express consent, and so we can imply that we have it until somebody opts out. Um, can spam is a great example of that. There are also some other implied consent that depending on the regions that your company is choosing to service, you may or may not want to utilize, right? Um, some of those other implied consent reasons can be you know, customers or ex-customers. Again, some companies view their relationship with a person as warranting some form of implicit consent that would allow them to market to them. Um, outside of that, some companies also choose to acknowledge hand raises as a mechanism of consent. And so a good example of that would be somebody coming through a contact us form or a sales request follow-up form um, where sales has to reach out per request. Um, and some of those things will imply consent for outreach during at least a specified period of time. So with you know, those kind of components out of the way, how legal talks about this, how we're gonna be talking about this with marketing operations, um, I just wanna talk about the overall program goals and outcomes that we're gonna to discuss today. Um, privacy compliance for most users sometimes feels like this image, right? We're, we're working away on our marketing campaigns, we're managing our data, we're, we're doing all the stuff that matters to the company. Um, and most marketers know that there's a little fire burning probably in the corner of their instance, which is their ability to capture consent, manage it, enforce it. Um, and for a lot of us that aren't familiar with our processes, it feels like a fire because it, it feels like something that's gonna come back and bite us, we just don't know when, right? Um, so the goal of today is gonna to be making sure that we you know, do not have this little fire burning in the corner of the room that all of my marketing operations users that are on this today understand the best practices they can follow to enforce privacy compliance. 
um, and make sure that they are safeguarding their instance and that they have confidence in their program. So um, what that means for us is any good privacy compliance program and specifically the one we're covering today, um, the program will safeguard your instance, right? We are going to tactically um, be making sure we're safeguarding our instance by leveraging unsubscribe for anybody that we cannot market to. Um, outside of that, for anybody that we are capturing some consent for or where we need to prove that we've captured consent for marketing, we're going to be capturing details around where that consent occurred, right? For any program built by an Atumote and for any program built by most marketing operations professionals, following scrim best practices is, is always a must. Um, and again, if we start to do all three of these things, um, we're gonna have clarity in our program, we're gonna be capturing consent, and we're gonna be safeguarding our instance. Um, and if we can do all of these things, I'm not sure how many people work with their legal team, but you know, this is a guy obviously that works in legal. Um, if you can't tell again, he is a legal professional. Um, he is really, really excited that we built out this program and that it's doing these things for us. Um, again, if you can't tell by the look on his face, he's definitely very stoked about this program and apologize for my, my surf lingo. Um, but again, if we do these things, legal is going to be really happy. You're going to be happy as a marketing operations professional um, and your company is going to be happy, right? A couple call outs to mention of what this program is not intended to do. Um, this program will not manage communication preferences whatsoever, right? So somebody choosing which streams topped into what newsletter, what subscriptions, that is not going to be managed by this program whatsoever. That should be a separate operational program and that should not be a part of privacy compliance whatsoever, right? Um, another big thing to call out is that Boolean checkbox that we talked about for like the opt-in um, or, you know, express consent. We are never going to be setting that anywhere in our program, right? We are going to leave that field to be set only by the user to show us when they have explicitly given us consent. Um, but there's nowhere in this program where we're actually going to be managing that, managing that field and setting it to true. So I just wanted to call that out um, as a big error that I see a lot of companies make. They try to set email opt-in to true when it's not always required by region. Um, and later on, that causes some issues when people change regions potentially and you service up that field for them. So moving on now to talk about the ideal program state, um, we're going to jump into some of the components that actually make up our desirable program. Um, the first thing that we're going to talk about today are the fields that are leveraged in the program and not those types of fields whatsoever. We're actually talking about the fields that are utilized in the admin console. Um, and so jumping right into this, some of the fields we're going to leverage today and best practices um, we're going to have a set of fields that are focused on capturing consent. Um, we talked about the two things the program is going to do. It's going to be safeguarding the instance and it's going to be capturing consent. These are the fields that are going to give us insight into what consent we have captured, right? We've got that email opt-in Boolean field, which is going to be the true false that the user only is ever going to be setting. From there, whenever we do get an opt-in, we're going to set an email opt-in date. We're going to set in the opt-in source, which is the values or details that we have for how they gave us their opt-in. And then we're also going to set kind of a vanity email opt-in status. Um, this is never going to be leveraged outside of operations or maybe for sales use, um, but this is just to provide additional context on whether what type of consent we have, if any, or if we don't have consent, it'll be a visual indicator of that. So this is all how we're going to be capturing consent, um, but we also need to enforce consent. And so the fields that we're going to be using to enforce consent throughout our instance are unsubscribed, which is a Boolean field. Um, we're going to be setting that Boolean field to true anytime somebody does not have the appropriate consent. Uh, we're going to be setting an unsubscribe reason to privacy compliance and then potentially depending on if you're utilizing some of those implied consent reasons um, we're going to be setting a consent expiration date for some of those implied consents uh, that may expire over time um, and so i want to call something out really quick that i mentioned there um, this program and privacy compliance as a whole should be managed by unsubscribe um, i always get into conversations with uh, companies about their sales users how do they know whether they can market to somebody how do they know whether they can't how does the marketer know unsubscribe is our source of truth right um, and this means any record that is coming in that we do not have um, consent to do direct marketing is going to be automatically suppressed from mailings. They're going to be marked as unsubscribe with an unsubscribe reason of privacy compliance. Um, and this is going to occur on creation or when a person's location changes um, or if they withdraw their consent at any time. Um, so just as one call out that people tend to miss is regardless of the status, regardless of that email opt-in field, our source of truth in this program is going to be unsubscribe. Um, and that should almost always be your best practice. Um, if you can't leverage unsubscribe for some reason, you could always utilize a marketing suspend, um, but do talk about what field is best for your company as there are some different uh, preferences there. So we talked about capturing consent. We talked about enforcing consent. We're actually going to be storing some data in these fields um, and some of that data for like an email opt-in sort or source common values that I see are obviously like a system date time. We're going to want to include any UTM parameters potentially that we have our first and last lead source or lead source detail. Um, you know, re referring URL, anything that you have that's valuable to understanding where a person was created or where that consent was captured most recently is really valuable to be leveraging here. Outside of that, we did call out that unsubscribe reason. We're going to be setting the unsubscribe reason to privacy compliance anytime we're actually setting that for a privacy compliance reason. 
Um, for those of you that don't have an unsubscribe reason field in your instance, I think it's a best practice to create that field, have a couple um, choices that exist when people are going through your unsubscribe flow when they're requesting to be unsubscribed. Um, but we can also optionally set the unsubscribe reason to privacy compliance when we are taking an unsubscribe action on the record. Uh, give us a little bit more clarity on why the person is unsubscribed. And finally, we've got that uh, email opt-in status like I mentioned. Uh, I put the unsubscribe false and unsubscribe true in here only so that you can see how the status is aligned to what the actual um, you know, unsubscribe value should be. So anytime that we have a double opt-in and expressed consent or one of our implied consent reasons, we're okay having that unsubscribe be false. Um, but if we don't have any consent or we are pending double opt-in, we should always have that unsubscribe set to true. And that's how we're gonna be safeguarding our instance. Um, the campaigns that we're using to manage this data are going to basically be called these names and we're gonna be setting these statuses as people flow through them, which we will cover in a little bit. So now that we've discussed the fields, uh, we're gonna talk about the second most important part of this entire program, right? We've got our fields. Um, now we're gonna need to figure out how we're gonna manage our data. The way that we're gonna be doing that is via segmentation. Um, again, we showed that map earlier, um, and the purpose of this for people who aren't super familiar with segmentations is to give us a mechanism of kind of grouping these people together into similar processes um, or grouping them into whatever legislative processes that we may need to that we're gonna support in our program. Um, and so kind of a kind of great visual of that is we've got all these colors, people are getting sorted in, and that's what the segmentation is gonna do. It's gonna give us these nice buckets of people to treat based on law, based on region, et cetera. So jumping into this segmentation, we have two options that I typically see done. Um, the first approach is a legislative approach, right? Um, at the top, we're gonna pull off embargoed, and then underneath that, we're gonna have a segment for each privacy compliance legislative law or, or regional law that we wanna follow. Um, you could build out one segment for every process that your company may need to support, um, but this is really a legislative approach to how we're gonna be managing privacy compliance. The other approach you could take for your segmentation would be an operational-based approach, right? This is where we're no longer thinking about the region that we're supporting, but we're thinking about the actual tactical steps that the person is gonna qualify for based on um, their regional requirements, right? So here you can see that these segments are named double opt-in, they're named opt-in, they're named um, other, and then we've got that opt-out at the bottom. This is kind of a vanity way of us taking our operational processes and putting them over the segmentation to say, the people that are in these segments are gonna qualify for this type of operational process. Um, at the end of the day, which approach you take does not matter. What's important is that you do have a segmentation because people should only ever qualify for one process. Um, and I typically actually like to use a hybrid of these and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but really, you know, the goal is to make sure that we do have one segment for each unique process that we want to support. And so a good example of that is if we determine that Castle and the Australian Spam Act are so similar that we're not going to support processes uniquely for each because the processes are truly identical. Um, I would actually leverage opt-in as the value and I would use Castle and the Australian Spam Act together in there, right? Versus if we were gonna actually take different actions for Castle versus the Australian Spam Act, we would wanna treat those processes separately. And you need to think about your you know, holistic processes, everything under the sun, right? We're also gonna make sure that we are grouping those processes together, like I just mentioned. Castle and Australia should be grouped together into opt-in if we can, um, but if we can't, we keep them separate. We're gonna make sure that we always have an other and unknown. Um, one of the biggest issues that I see is people try to leverage default as their kind of other category for people that they don't have laws defined for. The hard part is people almost always wanna pull CAN spam out, and I do see a lot of attrition of records getting pulled from other regions in the world into CAN spam because that segment is evaluated before the rest of the world. Um, and if you're gonna use multiple fields to evaluate this, sometimes this logic gets confusing because you're gonna have one of their parameters be United States and you're gonna put them in can spam when really one of the parameters was some other country and we may wanna treat it as other. So again, it's best practice to pull that other out on its own, define all those countries. Um, and in that scenario, the default hopefully is zero or it's gonna highlight issues in your segmentation, which is useful. Um, and we're still gonna put that default somewhere. Unknown is important for us as well because there are some countries where we have, or some records that we're gonna have no information on whatsoever and we need to know how we're gonna manage those. Um, lastly, we do need to make sure that we're talking with legal and our company about what processes other unknown or default they're gonna fall into. Um, if we're gonna put them into opt-in, great. If we're gonna put them into you know, double opt-in, if we're gonna consider them as opt-out, whatever. We just need to make sure we have clarity on where those segments are actually falling in terms of process. And lastly, we wanna make sure we always sort by importance. Um, you're gonna notice that I took a more risk averse approach to this, meaning that I always wanna pull out embargoed and GDPR records first because I really wanna treat those preferentially before evaluating others. Um, a riskier approach or like a less strict approach would be looking for can spam records first before going down to GDPR at the end, right? Which is gonna say if they're in the US, pull them in first versus if they're in Germany, pull them in first. 
Um, and for more on segments, uh, I think you guys know all about them, so I'm not going to touch on that too much more. So now that we've talked about our segmentation groupings, we're going to talk about the fields that we can actually leverage in that segmentation. Um, some of the safer fields that you can use in general are fields like inferred country and country, which should be provided by on the form submit potentially. Um, the reason that these fields are safer to use is because these are fields related to the person, right? They're either provided by the person um, or they're inferred from the person, but it's based on that person's location, right? Um, some fields that may be a little bit riskier to use would be like account billing country, the account shipping country, any enrichment data, et cetera. And the reason that those fields are a little bit more risky is that you're no longer considering where the individual is located. You're much more focused on where that company is headquartered or where you know the, the person's location of their company. Um, and so again, do be mindful of considering what fields are best for your company to leverage. Um, one of the things that I do see all the time is enrichment, like I mentioned. Um, do be considerate of whether enrichment is writing to your country field um, or, or whether you're keeping them separate, which I think is the best practice. We really wanna make sure that we're not muddying the water with what was provided from the individual or inferred from the individual versus what was enriched or pulled from an account. Um, so do be very cautious of that. In the segments themselves, there are two different mechanisms that you could utilize to prioritize. Um, fields. I prefer the any method, and that's only because in a risk-averse approach, you really want to look for anybody that could qualify for a segment top to bottom. Um, on the left here, you'll see that we're using any, and we're looking for both inferred or our country location, um, versus you could also prioritize one field um, or even have a tiered field approach. Uh, logic along there would say, look at inferred country first, and if they have an inferred country, great. If not, we're only going to look at country if inferred country is empty, right? So that field is basically tiered where inferred is the primary field, country is the secondary field. You could do this all the way down for however many fields you have, but you do need to make sure that the logic is sound of, you know, prioritize inferred. If inferred is empty, use country. If inferred and country are empty, use region potentially. Um, I don't know what other fields exist in your instance, but you can kind of, you know, determine what your field priority is. Again, my preference is to use any and then to sort that segment accordingly based on what's needed. And that wraps up the segment conversation that we'd have around how we're going to manage privacy compliance. Again, no matter what segments we have, what fields we use, at the end of the day, we are going to have a whole list of people um, that we're going to be managing in the program. Um, and now that we've got the segmentations out of the way, we're going to jump into the, uh, the program itself. And sorry, I jumped a little bit quick, so you guys missed my sweet neographic uh, program. Um, in terms of every program we build at Atumos, we want to make sure that it's scalable, meaning that it'll work no matter how many records we put through it. We wanna make sure that it's clear um, so that anybody that's working in the system can understand exactly what it is and what each campaign is doing. We wanna make sure that it's robust, meaning that it's long-term durable. Um, if we need to change something or add a new privacy compliance grouping, we wanna make sure that that's eligible to do, which we're gonna enable. Um, it's gotta be an intelligent also. It needs to be able to basically manage itself effectively and provide proactive exception reports and alerts because again, we don't wanna to have to go in and check on it all the time. And lastly, we want to make sure that it's modular. We need to make sure that this program is standalone. Somebody can enter in it and be managed, you know, accordingly, no matter where they've come from. And then when they're spit out, they're done, right? But this program should be requestable from anywhere and it should stand alone with how it operates. Um, you know, the way that we actually at most like to manage, uh, you know, scrim in general is a lot with campaign is requested. This is a very debated topic. Um, I always like talking about a tree and you have roots uh, or you may have, you know, branches. Either way, you know, your, your roots can be the entry points into a program. The trunk is gonna be like your controller or central processing of the program. And we're gonna utilize these campaign requests to pull people in from the very start points into the program. And then also we're gonna push them from that main controller of the program into whatever appropriate process they should fall into, being the branches. Um, and we do that a lot again with the smart list having a campaign is requested and using choices on the flow step side to determine what other processes they're eligible for. Um, and so without further ado, it is now demo time. I'm about to jump over into our instance right now and continue this presentation. You guys, are, I hope you guys are able to see my screen. I believe that you can. Um, this is actually our Atimos inbox or instance, and I'm gonna jump down into the program that we've got running right now, which is some data management. Cool. Um, so this is our privacy compliance program. Everybody can see it in here. Um, again, as you'll notice up top here, we've got some triggers at the very top of this program. We'll get to those in a second, but you'll notice first that we do have one folder for every process that we're going to be supporting. Um, I gave them some nice vanity labels for us. You can see that the regions that we're supporting embargoed. Um, double opt-in is built out on its own, not in this number three folder, and that's because we could add another region where we would want double opt-in to apply to. Um, and this is kind of that modular approach of we're keeping it separate because it could be used in more than one place, right? Um, outside of that, we've got our data retention that we'll get to later on. Um, but starting off at our triggers, this is really where people enter into our program typically, right? 
um, this A up top lifecycle requested is going to be requested from whatever lifecycle pro processing program you may have existing in your instance. Um, for people who don't have a lifecycle processing program, this is when a person is created, we want to make sure that they run through privacy compliance. So even if you don't use lifecycle processing when they're created, this is going to trigger them actually starting the program. We may have some enrichment in our instance that's going to warrant or you know a re-roll through privacy compliance. At the end of the day, no matter what campaign they come through to start the program, they're all going to run into this sort into privacy protection campaign, right? This sort into privacy protection campaign is going to be requested, like we just mentioned, and let me jump into where it's requested. And on the flow step, it's actually going to be sorting down to determine which consent grouping this person should fall into. Um, you'll notice that we included a brief wait here to make sure that the segments have actually reconciled themselves on creation before running them through this, because we do want to make sure they have a segment set. Um, but then we're going to go look to say if they're in embargoed, request that embargoed. If they're in GDPR, request GDPR. If they're in one of these other regions, request our castle. And if not, we're going to request can spam. Finally, we do have a default. This is gonna help us catch if we have errors in our segmentation. You may leverage smart listen here if you really need to, but I would discourage that. Um, and again, you'll notice that we are sorting these choices in terms of what is the highest, you know, the most highly prioritized segment. And it is always the best practice to have errors anytime you're using choices to determine if logic is breaking down because we don't want somebody to not qualify for any of these. We wanna get alerted. Um, and that's what this is gonna do for us. So we know that people have been created in the program, they've been routed into their appropriate folder, um, and you'll notice that each one of these folders down below actually has that consent controller, the 100 series, 200, 300, 400 series. This is basically the entry point into that region. Um, for some regions, you're gonna notice there is additional logic. In regions like Castle, as an example, this express consent controller is gonna determine, or sorry, this, this Castle consent controller is gonna determine what type of consent we have or what type of implied consent we have, and if not, it's gonna default down to no consent before giving us an error message. So this, just like how we talked about the sort to privacy compliance, we know that the person is actually located in Castle or their segment may change to be in Castle. Now we wanna evaluate what type of consent that we have from them. And we're gonna do the exact same thing we did up top here. We have some smart lists that exist down here that align to each of these categories. Um, express consent in this example is that that explicit opt-in is set to true. If so, they're gonna run through the express consent campaign, which exists right here, right? Um, if not, we're gonna evaluate them against a couple different implied consent reasons. Um, and lastly, we're gonna look for no consent, that email explicit opt-in being set to false before going down and sending out an error. And again, this may not actually always fire because you'll notice that we're using a Boolean field up top and below. But again, this is just always a best practice anytime you're using choice logic to have an error as the default. Um, some regions, as I just mentioned, like can spam, don't have any other processes because we know right when somebody qualifies for them, uh, or for can spam that there's only one option that we can take. It's an implied consent based on region. As long as they haven't unsubscribed, we're fine uh, you know, continuing to market to them. Um, and so you'll notice here that this controller is actually taking all the actions that we need in this folder versus in Castle, all the actions that we're taking to reconcile, unsubscribe, manage that email opt-in status, the date, time, and sources are all managed in these sub campaigns, right? So again, Castle, this is gonna be doing all the actioning versus up top here, the controller is gonna be determining which sub campaign needs to be actioning on the record. Moving down to GDPR, this is a little bit simpler than Castle, obviously. Um, Castle does have some of these implied consent components where GDPR may not. And again, this is all just depending on how you guys are perceiving privacy compliance or your legal team is. Um, here, we're doing the exact same thing because the logic is more simple like we discussed. You'll notice that this one is actually truly looking at that explicit opt-in versus explicit opt-in being set to false to determine whether it should go to expressed versus no consent. And again, in this scenario, this should never fire. Um, but again, we just always like to have fail safes in place uh, to make sure that we're protecting our instance. Um, you do notice that we have an embargoed uh, folder down here. This is just to pull embargoed countries and mark them as unsubscribed um, no matter what. Um, and we'll jump into some of these other folders here in just one second. Um, I'm trying to figure out what is else is useful for us to, to manage. I think it'd be good for us to go in and show some of the ways that we're managing some of these campaigns. Um, again, you'll kind of notice that we do have one campaign for each type of consent that we have. So earlier when I was showing those email opt-in statuses that were available, you'll notice that that express consent aligns with this one versus the implied consent statuses are going to align with these campaigns versus no consent. Um, so obviously the express consent, this campaign is going to be removing unsubscribe whenever we've set it to true. Um, and let's actually go look at it. You'll notice these campaigns are actually also triggered by that Boolean getting set to true. And that's to kind of jump us down a little bit further. We know that it was set to true. We know that they're in our region. Let's go ahead and take the action on them. Um, and some of the actions that we're gonna do, it is a best practice to always have add to list um, for each one of these campaigns. So you'll notice that we have some static lists just to determine which campaign the person actually ran through most recently. 
From there, we're going to be setting an explicit opt-in date. Um, if the source is empty, we're going to set it with some of our parameters. If it's not empty, we're going to keep the existing value. And then we're going to concatenate the new sources on the end. Um, really quick note on email, uh, the explicit opt-in date in the source. Um, I always like to keep the explicit opt-in dates consistent with the Boolean field, right? So if the Boolean is true, we want to make sure that we have a date. If the Boolean gets set to false, we're going to want to make sure that we're clearing the date. Um, source is different for me. Um, source, I like to keep as a running history of all the times that we have gained or lost consent from a user. Um, so it is, in my opinion, a best practice to keep this source value concatenated throughout all of your campaigns, even when you're capturing no consent, because that's going to give you your running history of time. Uh, and what I mean by that is you could potentially have um, somebody who came in a while ago and gave you a consent that could have unsubscribed six months later after you've been marketing to them. Um, and you're going to have no explicit opt-in. You're going to have no explicit opt-in date. Um, and you're going to know you have sent in emails over the last six months. When you're trying to determine why that email opt-in source or the explicit opt-in source as we have it in our instance is going to give you insight into, well, we initially captured their source on, you know, back in December, we emailed them for a while and then they withdrew their consent by unsubscribing um, more recently. Right, and, and that's gonna kind of give us that context to make sure we're safeguarding our instance. Down below here, we're gonna basically look to see if unsubscribe is false, we're gonna do nothing. Um, the reason that we put this in here is that Marketo's really funky with Booleans in the, in the activity log, and what I mean is, if we just look to say if unsubscribe is false, set it to true, or vice versa, if we say if true set to false, um, even if the value is already false, it's gonna look like it changed at the time you're changing it if it's not. So this is a way to kind of quiet that activity log down, meaning if we know it's false, don't change it, um, versus if we only did this, it would actually look like it went from true to false, even though the value may have already been false historically, right, which can cause some confusion. So again, we're pulling off anybody that's false, and only if we set unsubscribe for a privacy compliance reason are we actually going to revert that value, right? And this is a way to kind of protect the users unsubscribe themselves, right? they're going to be setting their own reasons. They may not even provide a reason, but anytime we are unsubscribing a record for privacy compliance, we are going to set this status. Um, and so again, we're only going to remove unsubscribe when it was us who appended it. Um, and that's what this is intended to do. Um, you'll also notice down below here, um, you know, we're going down and actually removing the unsubscribe reason here as well. Um, this is a little bit out of order. And the reason why is it's, it's better to look for unsubscribe reason up top here before we know it out. In general, whenever we're actually setting the values themselves, and you'll notice in all these other campaigns, it is always a best practice to set the reason before you're actually setting the field value. Um, and that's because sometimes we may wanna trigger off of the actual value of unsubscribe getting set to true or being set to false. Um, and in this example, when unsubscribe gets set to true, we only wanna process some records when the reason is privacy compliance, which we'll actually talk about down here in this withdrawal of consent in a little bit. Um, but again, just a general best practice, anytime you're using a field and you're having a reason to indicate why the field is set a certain way, make sure you're always setting your reasons first before you're actually changing the, the core root value. Um, that way you can use that reason as a filter um, on that data value change in other campaigns. So again, uh, you know, if it's a privacy compliance reason, then we're gonna null out the unsubscribe reason as well. Um, add to lists, I also like to do first. I'm sure many people know that this is one of the fastest activities that runs. So this is kind of a really great fast proxy to know where people are at. Um, before taking some of the slower activities, which you know are listed down below. And again, you'll notice none of these campaigns are ever touching that explicit email opt-in or our email opt-in Boolean field. We are only ever managing the date, the source, the unsubscribe uh, values, the unsubscribe reason, um, and that consent field, right? So moving down into another version here, let's go look at one of these implied consent. Um, again, if your company is determining that you have an implied consent for a customer, um, you may have this set up to listen for like a lifecycle status change or uh, is customer changing to true or an account type changing to customer. Again, we know that they've become a customer and that they're in our segment that warns this implied consent. In here, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna add them to our static list. Then we're gonna do the same actions that we took. In here, you'll notice that if it's false, we're not gonna do anything. If not, then we're gonna revert the false just like we did before. Um, you'll notice in here that we're gonna remove some consent expiration. Again. In some of these campaigns down below, the X customer or hand raise, um, we're going to be setting this value. And if for some reason somebody came in through a hand raise and became a customer and they have an existing expiration date coming up, we're going to want to null that out in all of our campaigns um, that, that warrant us nulling that consent expiration date versus these two potentially are going to be setting them. Down below for the consent status, you're going to notice that we're actually not setting the status in this implied consent campaign if we already have a double opt-in or express consent opt-in. Um, and the reason is, is somebody could have already given us an express consent in the past, 
They could have even given us a double opt-in when they were located in Germany and changed regions. And now that they became a customer, we don't want to compromise our actual expressed consent values um, or our status field with an implied consent reason, which is of lesser value to us. So again, if their high value consent already exists, we're going to keep it as is. If not, we're going to update it to that implied consent customer. Um, we're going to manage you know, our explicit opt-in source the exact same way that we've talked about previously. And you'll notice that I do have kind of a vanity label here as opposed to the place where they gave us that because this is us assuming that consent. Right? Um, and we're going to remove them from whatever other consent campaigns exist. Um, I'm going to go show you guys one of these X customer ones really quickly. Um, and then I'll hopefully wrap up here in a second to give you guys some questions. So again, similarly to uh, this customer one, this X customer one is listening for that account type or whatever value you're using in your customer to churn. Um, this one would be setting like whatever the consent expiration date is in the future for how you're managing X customers. Again, some companies will say we had an existing business relationship after six months, we want to be able to lose consent, but we want to be able to market for six months, right? Um, and so in this one, this one may set a consent expiration date for the current date plus six months versus in this hand raise, you know, somebody comes through one of our hand raise forms, they've requested direct outreach um, and they're located in our regions that, are, that weren't this. You're going to notice that in here, we're setting that consent expiration date in the future. So again, we add them to our list, we manage our unsubscribe values, we're setting their consent expiration date for two weeks from now, which means we're only giving ourselves two weeks to actually reach out to the person and try to have that dialogue related to their hand raise. After that two week time, if we have not actually gotten whatever consent is necessary, our consent expiration batch is going to be listening for that date stamp and reverting all of our records to set unsubscribe to true, to set it to privacy compliance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so another example of that here, I'll go show you this consent expired. Again, this is just a daily batch because we're just looking for anybody whose consent expiration date is today. And I may need to actually refresh because Marketo decided that it was going to freeze on me really quickly. Gotta love live demos. Um, as that's loading, and maybe it'll refresh on me, these are the double opt-in controllers. Again, this is requested from that express consent controller um, or this express consent campaign. We know that they initially checked the box. We've got one smart list in here that's evaluating who warrants actually getting a double opt-in email. Um, and that's gonna intelligently send that double opt-in email for us. And so sorry, let's go show this one first, which is our consent expired batch. This one is basically listening for anybody whose consent expiration date is today. And then it's going to take whatever flow steps are necessary to basically set the unsubscribe to two, true. It's going to remove them from a couple lists as well um, and take all the actions that we need to, right? Um, going back down into the GDPR component, like I talked about, let's go look at this one because this is a little bit more of a complex campaign. Again, not everybody that qualifies for this may warrant the double opt-in depending on how you're managing your campaigns. Um, this could be expressed consent for some people and only double opt-in for some. Again, in that scenario, we've got one smart list in the flow step here that's gonna say if they're in Germany, as an example, based on our smart list that require double opt-in, we're gonna go ahead and send it. Um, and so this is kind of a blend of both approaches, whether you're doing operational or not. Um, but you're gonna see here that we're setting the explicit opt-in date, the source, all these values to align with the fields. Um, then from there, we're looking to say if, if they are located in a country that requires double opt-in, we're gonna set their unsubscribe to true, right? Because we know that we actually need to set that to true until we've gained consent. Um, if not, if we set it for privacy compliance, that's when we're okay removing it. Um, same thing with our reason values, we're managing those accordingly. Um, and then down here, again, we're not touching consent if we already have a higher form of it. Um, we're gonna leave it as is. If not, we're gonna set it to pending for records that require double opt-in versus setting it to expressed consent for records that do not require that double opt-in. And finally down here, you're gonna notice that if they're not in our regions that require double opt-in, we're gonna null out that consent expiration date because we know that they've given us their express consent and we, if we've set it before historically, we can remove it. Um, and then down here, if they're in a country that requires double opt-in, that's when we're gonna request that double opt-in email to get sent. Um, and so down in here, this 500 is sending the email, this 510 is listening for the email to be sent and this one's gonna remove unsubscribe, it's gonna set the email opt-in status to be double opted in, it's gonna you know, revert all those and manage those email opt-in status fields, et cetera. Um, I know I'm almost at time here. Uh, the last components that I wanted to cover very quickly are these data retention and withdrawal of consent campaigns. Um, 610 and 620 are related to CCPA, right? Marketo cannot fully service a request for information under CCPA or even data removal, and that's because it's very likely that your systems, or sorry, that the data for this user exists in multiple systems that Marketo may not even be integrated with. Um, but what we can do is we can have a form submit initiate that activity. Um, meaning when a person fills a form requesting information, we can set an SFDC task for somebody to go in and actually reconcile their data through the instance or provide it. Um, same thing with removal. This would create a task in SFDC for somebody to go in and actually delete all the data. 
Withdrawal of consent here is actually listening for an unsubscribe to be getting set to true, right? And this is basically our way of listening for the user to set a reason. You'll notice that this is why that setting the reason before setting the value is important because this is listening for that unsubscribe getting set to true. And we're looking for when the reason is not privacy compliance, because if we set this value for privacy compliance, we don't want this campaign to flow. We've already managed it accordingly up top. We only want this to flow if it was not us setting the value, um, which is why it's again important to set reasons prior to actually setting the statuses themselves. Um, and again, this withdrawal consent is gonna do the same thing as these no consent campaigns. It's gonna update the status to no consent, manage unsubscribe information, et cetera. That concludes the demo portion of this presentation. And so I'm gonna actually jump back into my root presentation. Um, so now that we've gone through the demo, uh, we're going to talk about transitioning from the ideal state um, or transitioning to the ideal state from whatever you have to date. Um, some steps that I think that are really helpful along this process are to build out the program skeleton, um, meaning build out the architecture that I demoed today. After you're done with that, you're going to want to meet with sales. Uh, and, and when I say build out the skeleton, I mean don't build out all the flows, but just build out the campaign so you can philosophically talk about how the program is going to be managed. Um, after that, you're going to want to meet with legal and sales. Don't forget your sales team in this process. Like more often than not, marketers just meet with their legal team and sales actually is not a part of that conversation. Um, and because of that, it affects sales processes. And then we need to go all the way back to the drawing board. So include your sales leadership in that call to discuss what implications this program may have um, relative to what you've been doing to date. You're going to demo this program for those people. You're going to discuss the current or discuss the current processes that exist to date and whether they're helpful or whether they're hurting your business. Um, and then you're going to ask if there's any needed changes to what's happening to date. And half the time your team may not even know what's happening. Um, so you can explain it and then ask if it's sufficient. Once you get that internal buy-in and approval to actually proceed with building out this program for your company, you're going to want to build out the new fields that we mentioned that are going to help us manage this program going forward. Even if you have legacy fields, I'd recommend building net new fields, migrating the data, and then starting off fresh as opposed to utilizing fields that have been managed historically. Um, you're also going to want to make sure that you fully configure the program at that time using all of those fields. And then you're going to need to review the configured program and all the flows with legal and with your sales team. Again, don't, don't not include those, that sales leadership team in there. They're going to be very sad. Um, once the program is ready to go live, um, you're going to want to make sure that you start migrating as much legacy data as you have historically into your new fields. Um, and you need to also discuss with your sales team how if processes have changed, how you're going to manage people that you may not have captured consent from previously, but are requiring it now. Um, this is another great use case for that consent expiration date. This is an easy way to kind of grandfather people into your process. You can set their status to say implied consent legacy data. You can set the consent expiration date to be like a year from now or whatever time frame you think is suitable. Um, and that basically gives you one more year of marketing to an individual to try to get their consent. And if after a year's time you have not gotten consent for some reason, you're going to go ahead and, and unsubscribe the person um, to make sure that we're no longer marketing to them. Um, and again, this is also another reason why never appending that explicit opt-in is, is valuable in any of our campaigns, because um, if one of these people that we didn't capture from data historically comes back to our, our forms, we want them to give us that consent now, which can qualify them um, going forward for marketing. Once that data has been migrated, once you've addressed how you're going to uh, manage historical data, we're going to need to enable that new program and disable the existing. You can actually leave your existing program running side by side if it's using separate fields, depending on your preference. And then obviously, you're going to want to monitor records running through the programs. Um, by, by region, just checking them as they're created um, to make sure that everything is flowing as expected. Um, and so now that we've discussed, you know, the, what privacy compliance is, the ideal program state, and ways that you can migrate, um, we have reached the conclusion of this presentation. And I want to thank you all for your lovely participation and engagement. And I will pass it back over to my trusted host, Rusty. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Keith. Um, uh, really appreciate you keeping us all out of the fire uh, with the privacy and, and compliance controls. Uh, we do have just a couple minutes left for kind of a Q&A. So I want to uh, address those real quickly. Uh, and then yeah. we can wrap shortly after that. Uh, first question is actually um, related to, you know, having duplicate email addresses in Marketo. What's the implication of having, if you've got, uh, you know, a heavy volume of duplicates in your system and, and how does that impact your, your privacy and compliance programs? Yeah, so in general, you know, these, these programs are always gonna be triggered on creation and you're also gonna be reconciling existing records into your database. Um, depending on how the duplicates have records in them, if one duplicate does not have data or, or has country data that warrants an unsubscribe and you append that, unsubscribe is durable, which means it likely will propagate onto both records if it is set to true. Um, so that's helpful in some scenarios where you're kind of managing privacy compliance because again, unsubscribe typically is email based in your Marketo instance. 
Um, so again, it's kind of a good safeguard, um, but you do need to be mindful that if your duplicate record is lacking data for opt-in and consent, you may want to reconcile that. Um, I think at the end of the day, duplicates, while they do persist in every record, should be something that a company addresses sooner rather than later because it can just cause all sorts of nightmares with engagement programs, uh, with how you're managing privacy compliance is another great example. Um, so obviously you want to try to fix that root issue. Um, but again, in my opinion, it's not that big of a deal only because it is ideal to have both records unsubscribed if needed. Um, and if a sales team member is actually trying to reach out to somebody and they can't because of unsubscribe and it is duplicate related, it'll start to kind of highlight those examples. Um, so again, I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of seeing where processes are breaking down and where issues are occurring and letting the sales team pull them up as issues um, and then going in to try to figure out why. And if it's duplicate based, let's address it when it happens. Um, so that's my stance. Great, and leads us actually into the next question you just touched on, the durable unsubscribe. Um, is there a limit on that data retention? So when somebody comes back in, we know that they stay unsubscribed if they've been deleted, but uh, what's, the, what's the data retention on, on the durable unsubscribe or how long my, is that active? Yeah, my, my understanding is that durable unsubscribe is like instance wide, and that means that when a record is deleted, um, it's gonna evaluate whether or not unsubscribe was set to true during the time of deletion. If it was set to true during the time of deletion, the next time that the record is created, it will automatically be unsubscribed when created, um, and it will remain on that cached durable unsubscribe list until the value is changed, is my understanding. So I've never actually heard, and, and I'm not entirely confident in my answer here, but I've never heard of the durable unsubscribe list not maintaining itself forever. And my understanding currently is that if you did revert the field from uh, true to false during the second time that record existed, if you deleted it again, it probably it would not be on that list, and that's because it's changed. So. Um, again, it should get added to that durable unsubscribe list when it's deleted and unsubscribe is set to true. Um, and the second time when you remove it, it should actually remove it from that list until it's set to true and deleted again. Um, so again, I, I actually do want to double check that. I'll, I'll follow up uh, with whoever asked that just to provide some additional context, but that is how I understand it to work. If that is not how it works, please let me know. I would love to, to hear from somebody who has better insight into that functionality. Great, no, I appreciate appreciate the the insight on, on the durable unsubscribe. I think that's kind of confusing for a lot of people, you know, uh, the questions around that. So uh, lastly, and we'll wrap up here. Um, last question is, is there a, a place to go, you know, check for compliance changes? Does uh, compliance laws change uh, country to country? Is there a, a good place to keep track of that? And how would we, uh, you know, how do we stay abreast of the changes in uh, compliance laws? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a hard question to answer because where people get their information is almost always seeming not to say stale, but um, I think the the COVID stuff that's happening right now is actually a perfect use case to like where do you find reliable information and how accurate and timely is it? Um, in general, I think that your legal team is going to have to to basically know where those source of truths for data and information are, um, whether it's actually the the laws that are published um, or whether they can find other resources that they will trust. But again, this is why your legal team being the people that determine what is needed to happen and why is, is a safeguard because it enables you to kind of wash your hands of how the program's functioning, assuming it's doing what legal assumes it is, right? Um, so again, your responsibility is to make sure the program is doing what legal needs it to do. And it's legal's responsibility to understand whether your privacy compliance processes are actually meeting the current standards that are required or whether they're lacking. Um, and so again, I would actually include that as part of the conversation with your legal team when you go live is to remind somebody there that they need to go in and check some of this compliance to see if it's changed since we last discussed it um, and be very proactive about notifying us when a change needs to occur. Um, I think the industry as a whole is really good at flagging when new privacy compliance laws come into effect that can, uh, can basically um, affect people. Uh, and so I always hear it from a lot of peers and from the industry as a whole. And then everyone's from our legal will come over and say, hey, what are we doing? This is coming up. We've heard from our peers. How are we gonna manage this? Um, so again, hard to say where the best source of truths are for those data. I'd say that the, the laws themselves are, but again, it shouldn't even be your job to go find that information. It really should be your legal teams. Great. Awesome insight. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and that actually, uh, that wraps up our Q&A portion. So uh, I'd like to thank Keith again for the awesome presentation, uh, keeping us all compliant, showing us how that's managed within Marketo. Um, I'd also like to remind everybody that this is a taste of the kind of content that you'll be getting from the full MopsCon, which will happen this fall in September. Uh, look for a follow-up email that'll be coming to your inbox. We are recording all these sessions. We are going to make the slide decks available for download. Um, that'll be in the follow-up email. And uh, as a reminder, since you registered for the spring preview, we're also going to be offering a, a discount for the full registration for MopsCon in, uh, in fall. So that'll be a $150 discount on your registration for MopsCon. 
this year. Um, I would also like to leave with uh, talking about an additional resource. If you're not familiar yet with the MOPS Pros Slack group, I highly encourage all of our MOPS practitioners, Marketo users, uh, you know, marketing professionals and practitioners, go check out the MOPS Pros Slack group. Um, that is a, a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer group. Uh, of MOPS professionals from all over the industry uh, in all walks of life and, and marketing operations. Um, if you've got a problem or you're working on a project that, uh, that you, know, you need some help and advice on, you're probably not the first person uh, to come across that. So MOPS Pros is a great place where you can go get some advice from people who have been there and seen that. So we'll also include a link uh, to that MOPS Pros Slack group in the follow-up email post session. So uh, that being said, thanks again, Keith. Wonderful job. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, everybody else. Um, feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn if you want to stay in touch. And if not, no worries. But I really do appreciate you attending today. Yeah. And uh, uh, Rusty from Atumos also appreciates, appreciates you attending today. So uh, we have one more session coming up uh, right after this. So stay tuned for that for the fourth and final session of the uh, MopsCon Spring Preview. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your questions. And I look forward to seeing you on the next session.